Hi, this is Chase Thompson, pastor of First Baptist Church of Central City, and we are so glad that you are streaming this sermon today. We provide these sermons online so that you can have the opportunity to hear and be reminded of God's Word at any time. We also hope these sermons will provide an opportunity for you to share the message of Jesus with others. Basically, we hope these sermons will build you up and lead others to know Jesus. That being the case, please know that our prayer for you is that you would be plugged in and involved in a local church. God calls us to be a part of a local body of believers under the care and leadership of local pastors. These sermons cannot replace that. So if you don't have a church home, we would invite you to come and be with us at any time. At First Baptist Church of Central City, we would love to have you. And thank you again for tuning in. May the Lord be with you. Good to see you all today. If you're a guest with us here, my name is Chase Thompson. I'm the pastor of First Baptist Church Central City, and what a privilege and a blessing it has been today to see a young believer be baptized. We are so thankful uh, for that wonderful opportunity in our church. Thankful to have Daniel Evans with us leading worship today, as he mentioned. He didn't tell you this. He found out at about 7 o'clock last night that he was going to be leading worship at First Baptist Church Central City. Uh, Brother Andrew had some sickness in the family. Sadly, it was COVID, and uh, he came down with a fever, and so he is watching from home. Hey, Brother Andrew, it's good to see you and your family. Uh, so be praying for them, and we look forward to them being back with us, hopefully, uh, this week. Uh, but do keep them in your prayers. Thankfully, no one was having any uh, too serious of symptoms, uh, but certainly sickness going around. Uh, if you have your Bibles, open them to Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. Uh, Genesis 2, verse 15. 15. Uh, we have been in Genesis January, and for the past two weeks, we've been looking at God's work of creation, and specifically, we have seen how mankind is God's crown jewel in creation. Uh, in Genesis chapter 1, we saw where God made mankind, male and female, in His image. We are made in the image of God. We have the image and likeness of God, and therefore, we are God's blessed creation. Then we saw in Genesis chapter 2 how male and female are both made equally in God's creation. Both male and female have the same dignity, the same value, the same respect, but God in his design made male and female very different. And these differences carry over into God's design for marriage and for the family as well. Husbands and wives have very different roles within marriage. The husband has responsibility and leadership over his family, and the wife is called uh, to be the companion for her husband as they seek to serve the Lord and serve his kingdom together. But we look at Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2, and then we look around at the way things are today, and we can see that things are not the way they should be. And so the question we're asking of the scripture this morning, very simply, is how did the world become so broken? And on the flip side of that, we're asking, is there anyone who can put it back together again? This morning, I'm not going to ask you to stand for the Scripture reading. We're going to cover a lot of Scripture very quickly together this morning, so you can remain seated. But before we turn to the Scripture, we're going to break it up as we go. I'd like to invite you to pray with me. Almighty God, we thank you for your Word. And Lord, we know your Word is true. We know it is eternal. We know it is authoritative for our lives. And God, we pray that you would help us to bring ourselves into submission to your Word this morning. Lord, we pray that you would show us the cross. We pray that you would show us the glory of Jesus Christ, our Savior, today. Lord, we pray that you would help us to see our sinfulness and our need of salvation. And Lord, help us to see the free offer that is available to all who would repent and trust in Christ. God, we pray that you would give us wisdom this morning to recognize the destructive nature of sin in our lives and in our hearts. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to recognize your faithfulness and your goodness, which we just sang about, for truly all of our lives, even when we didn't realize it, you have been faithful and good. God, we pray today that you would show us mercy by opening our hearts and our minds to receive your word. And it's in Christ Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Look with me, if you would, to Genesis 2. We're going to read verses 15 through 17. Uh, we did not read this last week. Last week we began in Genesis 2, verse 18. Uh, so just to take note here, uh, these first few verses take place before Eve was created. Okay, this is just Adam here in the garden. It says this, Genesis 2, verse 15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat 
freely. Take note of that. You may eat freely from any tree of the garden. That is an extraordinary amount of freedom. But, verse 17, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it you will surely die. God is telling mankind here that you are not to pursue your own human wisdom, but rather God is going to reveal wisdom to them. He's going to cause them to grow. And in the same way that God reveals wisdom to us today through His revelation, through the Scripture, the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We are to receive our wisdom from God. We're not to usurp it for ourselves. Now look with me, Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden. Now first of all, we recognize immediately that's not what God said. God said you may eat freely from all the trees except for one. Just one. Uh, That prohibition is Uh, infinitely small compared to the freedom they have to eat freely of all the other trees. Just one, but the serpent here is tempting Eve. Verse 2, the woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. Uh, A couple of things here. God never said don't touch it. God just said don't eat from it. And here already, as the serpent speaks to Eve, we find that she is downplaying God's promises. Uh, In verse 2, from the fruit of the trees of the garden, we may eat. Right? Actually, they may eat freely. And she is emphasizing the prohibition, we shall not eat from it or touch it or we will die. Verse 4, the serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. He calls God a liar. He says, you shouldn't trust God. He's lying to you. You won't die. Verse 5, for God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened. And you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Not only does he call God a liar, but he impugns God's motives. He says God doesn't want you to eat because God's afraid of what will happen if you eat. You will become like God. And folks, don't miss the irony here. This is the serpent speaking, which we're going to talk more about in just a moment, because serpents don't typically talk. Uh, This is the serpent speaking, who is a part of the creation that mankind has dominion and authority over. Because mankind was uniquely made in the image and likeness of God. Mankind has no need to become like God. We've already been made like God by our creator but here again in verse 5 he says God knows that in the day you eat from it your eyes will be opened and you will be like God knowing good and evil verse 6 when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise she took from its fruit and ate and she gave also to her husband with her and he ate now leave that verse up on the screen grace and if you would That doesn't seem like a big deal, her husband with her, but here's what we have to recognize. The serpent has circumvented this family order. Adam's job was to take care of his family. He was to protect and provide for and guide and love his wife. The serpent spoke to his wife, but this whole time Adam has been there, and he has done nothing. And finally, when she eats of this fruit, this forbidden fruit, what does he do? He eats as well. Verse 7. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. Now this intimacy and this security, the safety of marriage between husband and wife that we talked about last week has been broken to the point that they cover themselves up from each other. There's now a barrier between the husband and the wife. Brothers and sisters, God gave mankind every single tree to eat freely from except for one. Just one. And all the trees were good. And this tree was equally good, but they were not to eat from it. But the serpent comes and deceives them. And this serpent, the scripture makes clear throughout uh, the Old and New Testament, is our ancient enemy himself, Satan. Uh, What you're finding in the serpent is a manifestation of, an incarnation of 
the devil who is tempting Adam and Eve to sin against God, to align themselves with him, and to disbelieve what God has said. And that's what they do. They are tempted and they sin because they think that it will benefit them. And here's the thing that we must understand in our lives. Sin always seems beneficial. It always seems beneficial, but it always brings destruction. Uh, just by way of a silly analogy, uh, maybe you made some New Year's resolutions this year and you decided you're going to start waking up early in the morning and exercising. And so you set your alarm for 4 or 4.30 in the morning and that alarm goes off and for a few days you're getting up and you're doing it and you're feeling better during the day. But then day, let's be honest, two, right? Day two or three maybe, that alarm goes off and you think, man, feels good in this bed. It's nice and cozy in the bed, especially days like we've had recently with the cold. It's warm in the bed. You don't want to get out from those covers, and so you talk yourself into staying in bed. And you say, you know, I had energy when I worked out yesterday. I'm really going to have a lot of energy if I get more sleep. And so you sleep for a couple more hours. And then ironically, the rest of the day, you feel sluggish. And you don't have the energy that you thought you were going to have, and you're frustrated with yourself because you're already behind on your goals. You're already behind. Uh, you're not staying consistent in what it is you set out to do. Well, church, in a much more serious way, sin always seems beneficial. It always seems pleasurable. It always seems enjoyable. It always seems like it is going to bless your life, but all it will ever do is bring destruction in your life without exception. Okay, whether you realize it or not, whether you are capable of recognizing it or not, sin will destroy your life. It will destroy your soul. It only brings negative effects on you. Last week, we talked about husbands and wives. You know, we talked about how you have to put work into your marriage. It can seem beneficial to you when you're gone all day and you're with other people and you're working when you come home not to put any work, not to put any effort into your marriage. Uh, it can seem beneficial because it's more comfortable to sit down and veg out in front of the TV on the couch and eat dinner on the couch and not have much discussion. But when you continue in that night after night after night, you are sowing destruction into your marriage. Uh, it can also seem beneficial to you in marriage uh, when there is an argument, when there is a fight, to become loud and to get angry and to really get as uh, absolutely nasty as you can with what you say so that you always get your way and you feel like the winner and you think that benefits you in every way when the reality is you are sowing destruction into your marriage. Destruction that one day you must reap. Brothers and sisters, sin promises wonderful things. It promises that you'll win. It promises that you'll be benefited. It promises grand things, but it can never truly deliver. Sin only delivers in pain and destruction and death. And that's what Adam and Eve found out here in verse 8. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Uh, how often we long for God's presence. Here he comes face to face and they hide themselves. They had taken fig leaves from the trees to hide themselves from each other. Now they hide amongst the trees to hide themselves from God. Verse 9, Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? You think God didn't know? He knew, but he's calling Adam to account. And specifically, we're told he calls to the man, and he says to him, where are you? And in the Hebrew, that's a singular you. Where are you? This recognizes Adam's responsibility for his marriage. Verse 10, he, Adam, said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And he, the Lord, said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat. Again, God already knows the answer. Verse 12. The man said, Yes, Lord. I have sinned against you. Please forgive me, but most importantly, please forgive my wife. Please overlook my wife's sin. I should have been there. I should have taken responsibility. I should have protected my family. Is that what he says? No, it's not. Verse 12. The man said, The woman... The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree and I ate. 
so much for protecting and guarding and guiding your household. He blames his wife. It's her fault. And not only does he blame her, who else does he blame? He blames God. He blames God for his sin. It says, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree and I ate. This isn't my fault. It's not my responsibility. I'm not the one who made the mistake here. You did when you gave her to me. Verse 13. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, The serpent. The serpent deceived me and I ate. Church, one act can change an entire relationship. One harsh Word, one argument can change a relationship between two parties. Uh, there was a group of guys uh, when I was in college, two friends, they're very close, they're roommates, they were buddies. And one guy in particular, uh, he had this crush on this girl. He really liked her for several months. He had met her earlier in the semester and he was trying to work up the courage to ask her out. And he was just about to get there. And his roommate, who was kind of a ladies' man, one afternoon she just smiled at the roommate. Right then and there, he asked her out. And it didn't last very long, but that friendship was dissolved in that moment. They had been close. They continued to be cordial with one another, but there was a sense of betrayal that had happened. That one action destroyed that friendship. And what we see here with Adam and Eve is that their one sin, they're aligning themselves with Satan. Their rejection of God's will. Their rebellion against God as their king, as their Lord, as their authority changed absolutely everything in their lives and it changed everything from that time there up till today. The reason that there is brokenness and corruption in our world, the reason that people are born in sin and separated from God, the reason there is heartache and pain, and the reason that we must die, brothers and sisters, is all because of sin. It's because of the sin that began with Adam and Eve and has been passed on all the way down to us. The reason there's this heartache in our lives, when you see sorrow and pain and death, even among your own family, what you are seeing are the consequences of sin. You are seeing the curse of sin that has been brought into our world, and it is a wicked, hurtful, corrupting curse that has been brought about. Look at verse 14. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go, and dust you will eat all the days of your life. Snakes don't have legs. They crawl around on their bellies. Verse 15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. Now on the surface here, we recognize that in general, human beings and snakes don't get along. Right? Uh, my roommate in college once wanted to bring a snake as a pet to our dorm room. And this was not allowed, by the way. And I told him very plainly, because he said, I'm going to do it. And I said, if you do it, I'm turning you in. Right? And we were very close to one another. I didn't want anything to do with that snake. I said, what if he gets out? Right? In general, people don't like snakes. And one of the ways you can kill a snake is by crushing its head under your heel. There's a surface level truth here, but there's something much deeper below the surface. So we're going to come back to verse 15. But look with me to verse 16. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain, you will bring forth children, yet your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. For the woman, the most blessed task that she could have of bearing life, bearing children, now because of the curse of sin, pain becomes attached to that childbirth. There is risk with giving life for a woman now. There can be the risk of death with bringing about life in the world. And this is a result of the curse of sin. But notice what else it says. Yet your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Now, this is a very literal translation, but what it's talking about here is within God's design of the family, uh, where the husband has responsibility and leadership for his family, now, uh, because of sin, the wife is going to desire to take that. 
You're going to desire to take that responsibility, to take that leadership, and to domineer over her husband. That's a result of sin. And then it says, and he will rule over you. That's not talking about the way God designed the family. This is a domineering as well. The husband is going to domineer you instead, is essentially what he says as a result of sin. Verse 17. Then to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life, both thorn and thistles that shall grow for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. We're reminded again of Adam's responsibility here because Adam's curse is not only upon all men or just all people. Adam's curse affects all of creation. Mankind was made to have dominion over the creation, to bear God's image into the creation, and now all of creation has become broken because of sin. Brothers and sisters, sin is the reason why There's pain and risk in childbirth. Sin is the reason why there is tension between husbands and wives. Husbands who are supposed to be godly leaders in their home, but can be domineering. And we see terrible examples of abuse from husbands. But also, wives who are called to submit to that godly leadership that God designed, now desiring to usurp it instead, and also being domineering. There's tension. Sin is the reason why creation itself has been cursed. It's the reason why work can be so difficult and so frustrating. God made us to work. He made us to tend the garden. He made us to have dominion. Work is a good thing. But if you've ever had one of those days or many of those days where it seems like everything that could go wrong does, that is because that is a part of the curse of sin. We now toil in our work, and ultimately, because of our sin, we all must die. Mankind is given dominion over the earth. Any tree that you would desire to eat from except for one, you may eat freely from it. But now, because of sin, we must work the ground in frustration and difficulty to get food. And one day the ground that we had dominion over is going to open up and swallow us up when we are buried in death. We have dominion no longer. How can this be fixed? Who can put this back together? Look again at verse 15. God says to the serpent, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and and her seed. Something when we recognize about procreation, uh, let the reader understand, it shouldn't be her seed. It should say his seed. But it says her. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. Brothers and sisters, the answer to all of our brokenness is revealed here in Genesis chapter 3, and it is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, who was born of a virgin. Her seed. Jesus Christ, who was born the only begotten Son of God. Jesus Christ, who came as our Savior. He is the one who has come, and He is the one who has crushed the serpent's head. Yes, He was bruised when Jesus went to the cross in our place to pay the price for our sins. He was bruised. They took Him and killed Him, and they buried Him. But on the third day of his burial, Jesus rose from the dead in victory over death, hell, and the grave. He rose from the dead in victory over our sin. He crushed Satan's head so that anyone who would repent and believe on him would be free and would be saved and would be a work of new creation. Jesus Christ is our victor. He is the winner. He is our king who conquers. And throughout the New Testament, we see them pointing back to this passage of scripture look at first corinthians 15 verse 25 we've got this on the screens for you first corinthians 15 25 says for he christ must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet romans 16 verse 20 the god of peace will soon crush satan under your feet the grace of our lord jesus be with you hebrews 2 14 therefore since the children that's us share in flesh and blood we have bodies 
He himself, the Son of God, likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. In 1 John 3, verse 8, the one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. All of creation has been cursed, brothers and sisters, because of our sin. But God gives us victory through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And still today, even though we are sinners, God is kind and gracious to sinners. Look at verse 20. And now the man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all the living. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And now he might stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. So he drove the man out, and at the east of the Garden of Eden he stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword, which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. Many of you all have probably invited someone to church before and they responded and they said, if I came, the roof would probably cave in. Now that's a clever way of saying no. Uh, Most people don't really believe that would literally happen. But that sentiment, the roof might cave in. Church, that's not who God is. That's not how God operates towards sinners. Jesus himself said in Luke 6, 35, but love your enemies. And do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High, for He Himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Here in Genesis 3, we find that despite their sins, in verse 21, God provided garments of skin for Adam and Eve. They were leaving the Garden of Eden. They were going out into the weather now. They're going out into the harsh elements of a broken world. And all they have are fig leaves. And God provides them with an animal skin to protect them. Which tells us that an animal now, because of their sin, had to die for this provision. That sacrifice had to be made. And church, in the same way today, God has made a sacrifice for us through His Son, Jesus Christ. And though we are sinners, we are covered in His righteousness when we repent and believe on Him, when we trust in His sacrifice. He saves us and rescues us from the brokenness of this world. And God also showed kindness in verse 23 when He sent them out of the garden. Because church, God was preventing Adam and Eve from living forever under this curse of sin. From living forever in this consequence. Essentially, he was saving them from living out forever a hell on earth. Church, though you and I are sinners, God is kind and gracious to sinners. He has provided the sacrifice for our sins through his son, Jesus Christ, by which we might be saved by repenting and believing on him. And this sacrifice covers all of our sins, past, present, and future. He shows us grace throughout our lives. He holds us securely, and His Holy Spirit makes us more like Christ as we continue to follow Him. God provides for you, and He provides for me, though we do not deserve His provision. The next breath you will take comes from God. The next heartbeat you will have comes from the Lord. And we don't deserve it. Because we are all affected by this sin. We have all been cursed in our sin. And this morning I would ask you, where have you seen in your life today sin's greatest effect on you? Where do you see sin's effect on your heart and on your motives and your actions? Where have you seen sin's effect in your home and in your relationships, in your marriage? Where have you seen sin's effect on your future? Because we've already seen that our sin affects what happens next. There are consequences for our sins. How might sin have its clutches on you this morning? And would you not be free today by turning from those sins? By humbly coming before the Savior, Jesus Christ, who crushes the serpent's head. No matter what you are wrestling with 
today. No matter what has a hold of you, no matter what guilt you may feel, Jesus Christ offers a cleansing sacrifice. He covers us in His righteousness when we will simply turn from our sins and put our faith in Him. Praise the Lord. Pray with me. Father God, we thank you so much again for your grace in our lives and we thank you for our precious Savior, Jesus Christ, who crushes the head of Satan. We thank you, Lord, for Jesus who suffered and died on the cross and though he was bruised after being buried on the third day of his burial, he rose from the dead in victory that anyone who might repent and put faith in him would be saved. And God, we thank you for the new life you give to all who trust in Christ. God, we thank you for the celebration of new life in Colin's heart today as we baptized him, recognizing that we died to sin and we are buried and we are raised up to live a new life in Jesus. God, we thank you for the forgiveness and the cleansing that you offer to all who come. And even for those who have been saved, Lord, we thank you that when sin begins to affect our lives and our hearts, you can rescue us. Lord, you can free us from its grip. And so this morning, I humbly pray That if any of us here today have been caught up in our sins, if sin has a hold of us, Lord, if we have aligned ourselves as Adam and Eve did with Satan, God, that you would draw us back home. Draw us back to the powerful Savior who loves us and frees us. Draw us out of the old broken creation into the new creation that Christ is bringing about. Lord, we love you. And we thank you for your grace. And we pray that you would call us to respond to you this morning. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.